Well, I'll, I'll go next because I lived a block and a block and a half from Girard College. And in my, my beginnings were from southern roots. I grew, I was born in North Carolina, grew up in a small farm, uh, farming community with my grandparents. So uh, any of you who know about grandparents and you know about the tradition of Black South and living, you have a very uh, tightly knit core spiritually based family unit participation on every level. So I, I was reared as a worker. I, I was reared to be able to uh, accept the idea that purpose, purposeful living was about what we were here to do. And we all had things to do. We had chores. We had things that we didn't look at as work. We looked at it as like a way of being. So there was this great level of responsibility that I was born into that encompassed how I lived throughout my life, and even, even to today. Um, uh, as a transplant from North Carolina into the northern city, uh, first New York and then Philadelphia, eventually family moving around, um, I was always ingrained with a sense of individual pursuits based on collective benefits. So when, anything that I did, that I like somebody else to benefit from it. If I fed chickens, I'd write up and eat chickens later. Sometime later. <laughs> you know, if I cleaned up uh, um, the yard, people would have a better place to sit and enjoy it. So I, I like to do things. I like doing things to put things in order. So when I was uh, in my pre adolescent years in North Philadelphia, moving there from New York, I came into Philadelphia when um, the gang warfare thing was at its height in the 50s. And in the 50s, mid 50s, um, people were like um, erratically trying to belong to something. I never wanted to belong to anything. I was glad when people went away. <laughs> so it was foreign to me to be walking through neighborhoods where every four or five blocks there was another identification to, have, to be had. Where you from? You know, and that was the catch word of the day. Mm -hmm. Where you from, man? Mm -hmm. North Carolina. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it never occurred to me that it's like, what gang are you from? What gang are you in? You know, can you box? So, no, I don't I can't box. You know? <laughs> so all of these all of these ideas of association never captured my attention in terms of saying I must be affixed to this. I must have that identification so I'll feel validated. I never felt invalid. So the idea is moving through high school, junior high school in North Philadelphia, I always felt a, 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 an area of being an observer. I was always on the outside observing what's going on around me. Um, and at the same time, I maintained my, my essence of order and essence of discipline to do what needed to be done at any given time. I would wash dishes. I love ironing shirts right now. That's my therapy. I will wash shirts and iron shirts all day long. And, uh, Wait a minute. My own shirt. I love to do it. So, all of this is connected to um, it's connected to a way of being for me. Uh, in terms of doing things with the ironing of the shirts, I always had a, I would have a book with them. <laughs> I would, I keep this up next to the ironing board or wherever it works because things come to me when I'm putting things in order. When I'm cleaning my room, when I'm uh, arranging a closet or putting, I love to put things where they belong. So. The idea of organization for me was always a very singular notion because I could always see when things are out of order for other people. I cannot help people any more than to say, are, do, are you going to use this or do you want this to be here or do you know where your glasses are or my grandmother is aware of my teeth. You know? <laughs> so I always knew where they were. I always remember where I saw something last. So I'm still that way. I know don't clean up my space. Don't come in and help me. Don't put my paintbrushes away, you know, like, don't stack things. So there's a way of being consistent that is a blessing for some of us. You know, my blessing is the way of observation. I'm an artist. I'm a visual artist today. Uh, in many ways, I have a, a, this uh, power of gift of recall. 
I, I know if I've met you before, don't lie, talk about we met somewhere, and uh, I won't ever forget the sound of a name. If I say, what's your name? I may not remember your face, but if you tell me, you know, you know your name is uh, it's something like Fitzgerald McClinney, I know I never met anybody named Fitzgerald McClinney, because it doesn't click in my mind. It doesn't work register in my signals. So, moving into my out of high school days, into my early adulthood, I was going to, um, I was pursuing, um, my interest finally delved in and evolved into me going to art school, going to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. My journey took me through absorbing creativity and discipline and learning, and, and I got involved with the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And on this particular day that Kenneth talked about, May 1st, you know, it was a, it was a day for me, it was a nice day, weather-wise and everything else, and the clamor of the activity of the Jeeps uh, a block and a half away from my house perked my interest, you know, what's going on down the street there. And it was a time when my curiosity just led me to see, just from a distance, there's a police activity, something to do, I grabbed my book, you know, <laughs> I ran down the street there, and I saw all these jeeps and people were walking around, and I thought the war had broken out. <laughs> I watched that day, you know, I mean, I wasn't trying to get involved with any of that. Um, <laughs> looking at it, it was an event to behold, and it was significant because I like war movies, you know, and I like that kind of action. Kind of thing. So it was exciting, but by the time I got around to the gate and the police present, I knew something was up. It wasn't just one incident. So barricades were all around. I said, well, when this is over, you know, life will be normal again. But it wasn't over right away. I mean, it kept going on. And from day to day, people in the neighborhood were somewhat uh, uh, not, not really inviting it. They didn't understand what was going on. But I was very curious, so I kept going there. I went there until eventually, um, I said, this is good because I can draw people and you know, it helps me to get my fluid action group thing together. I was there as an observer and a documenter for my own purposes. And at the same time, uh, there was something uh, inspiring about it because coming from the South, like I say, I was, I was, racism was no stranger to me. I grew up around the whole idea of the Southern experience and black here and out there and people tell them what you want, what you're doing over here, boy. You ain't supposed to be over here, step back, go no, on, get away from here. So the police, I have this other thing I can go into any time I feel like. So at the time I wanted to be an antagonist with the police, I could say anything I wanted to say. Good evening, officer. How y'all doing? And as I mess with people's minds, you know, I like messing with people's minds. So I would draw in my book, and it also had a little label on it that said Handbook for Saboteurs. And I get a book like, you know, to my little book. And I draw, and they had this little, I don't know what level of intelligence they were necessarily, but it was obvious I'm 18 years old, I'm not a saboteur, I'm drawing. So, and it sparked somebody's interest to arrest me, to follow me and grab me and throw me, you know, into the police thing and take me to the police station on my way home. And I was, must have been there 15 minutes. And there was a whole group of people out there. Get him out, get him out. Walt Palmer and Alvin and Barbo, who became the secretary to the Attorney General, Robin and C. Nix Jr. later. All of these things happened to bring me into an awareness that being on the outside is fine, but there are people who are involved with everyone who care about people. And they got me out of there, and I was like going back to the wall, saying, "This is I didn't like the idea of somebody in my world." So I got into the world that was trying to get into my world, and that's when I became very dedicated to dealing with putting something in order, helping to be a part of putting something in order that was not right. And I learned more. Uh, I joined, became a, a member of the NAACP Junior Council, and. Um, meeting Cecil B. Moore and Kenneth and everybody else, we became, we became a nucleus in terms of the philosophy, in terms of the uh, stewardship of our communities, uh, joining people in my community who didn't understand it, uh, trying to help them on, become more politically aware. And from that day to this day, you know, my incorporation into politics 
and also being creative in the art form, um, it became a real platform for what I do as an artist. You know, my social, socio-politically motivated themes in my work, uh, in terms of what I do with music, you know, it fuels the lyrics for what we sing, what I sing about as an individual performer. Um, the background from my grandparents gave me a sense of, of uh, what's right is right, and if like, it's something worth doing, then you could believe in it and you were dedicated to it. So that's my story.